time trippers. The year is 1907, mass immigration to America. You must do a podcast. I'm afraid it is the only way. Welcome listeners to the podcast where we are sent back in time by a celestial time angel through the whole 20th century, year by year, event by event from 1901 to 1999. We must bring back an item each. Today we are blasting off to 1907. This was the year of mass immigration. Um, 1907 was like the peak of immigrants from all over the world coming to America. Um, and uh, in fact, an all, all-time an all-time daily high occurred on when 11,747 immigrants arrived. We're going to be hanging out in New York for a little bit, particularly around Ellis Island. Because um, in 1907, this was the busiest year at Ellis Island. Approximately 1.25 million immigrants were processed. So we're going to jump in the time machine and there see what was happening in Ellis Island get the immigrant experience well processed is the word because as you, as as ever Johnny I've got plenty of cold sick to pour on any any nice or romantic idea you might have about any of this I've um <laughs> I've been chatting to 2.0 and been given a big bucket of cold sick to pour on you. Oh, 2.0 is such a downer, though. Uh, I, I like to see the American immigrant story as one where they're chasing the American dream, you know, hoping that the streets are paved with gold, that they're going to lead themselves to a better life, get away from their struggles, from mm-hmm. uh, political strife, from economic demise, and yeah, build a better life for themselves. But how long will it take for them to get there? Dun dun, dun dun, dun dun. Okay, um, shall we? Yeah, fire up the time machine. Let's go. All right, 2.0, we're coming. Pile in. Time time. <laughs> so we got a boat coming into New York Harbour. Yeah. Stacked full of immigrants, they're all taking their first peek at the promised land. What do you think is the first thing that they see once they arrive in the harbour? There it is. Lady Liberty, uh, the new Colossus, the Statue of Liberty, on a huge pedestal. Oh, Lady Liberty, she'd be quite quite something to see for the first time. Well, yeah, I mean... For these, uh, for these newly arrived immigrants in America. Oh, God. It is really spectacular. Um, oh, I might read that poem. The Emma Lazarus poem. The famous poem. Go for it, yeah. Yeah, let's let's see what Emma Lazarus has to say. I think Emma Lazarus was an immigrant herself, was she not? Yes. I think Jew- uh, Jewish. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome her mild eyes command the airbridged harbour that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your story, pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Well, that's a powerful poem. I believe this poem, The New Colossus, is actually inscribed on a plaque at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Yes, but I should say, Johnny, that this um, poem, Emma Lazarus wrote it as part of a fundraising effort to raise money for the plinth that that mm. their, uh, the French donated the statue. Um, and they sort of... Because this was sort of slightly at odds with some... This poem, uh, perhaps slightly at odds with some of the US government policy... So actually the plaque they initially put on the inside of the pedestal. 
I see. Okay, so it was hidden, hidden from. You. Yeah, and it was not used as part at all as any part of the promotional campaign when the statue was built. It was just to raise money for that thing for the sure. thing. Sure. Yeah, I, I do know that it was written in 1883, and of course, the Statue of Liberty wasn't actually erected until 1886 in New York. So she's having to use her imagination a bit. But well, I think she. Um, I, I, yeah, I think it's. I think her words are, you know, largely good. Although it is also it, it is quite nationalistic as well. Interesting to see America carving out that identity for itself that many to this day think. It's a little bit of a myth, but I won't ruin our little journey, Johnny. The statue is beautiful. I won't pour any more cold sick for the minute. Let's just en- well, enjoy well, it. Well, yeah, I, I like the statue a lot. I'm a big fan of Lady Liberty, and, you know, she's such an iconic image of America, and uh, she, she's been, you know, around for a number of years. So, 1886, so has, as we uh, say, when she was So has Madonna, erected. but, you know... I don't trust yeah, there her. Are of, <laughs> there are plenty of iconic ladies in American culture, but I think if you had to name uh, one that is, you know, really standing out, I, I would put Lady Liberty well up there, certainly with Madonna, um, <laughs> Lady Gaga, these more modern ones. I think she can go toe-to-toe with them. Defo. So, yeah, a little bit maybe more about Lady Liberty. So, she was... Um, definitely an imposing statue. She was the biggest statue in the world at that point. The biggest statue, in fact, uh, that had ever been created. So I can imagine what what goes through the immigrants' minds when they're getting off, or not getting off the ship. I can imagine what goes through the immigrants' minds when they're approaching the harbour and their long journey has come to an end, Mm-mm. and they see Lady Liberty. She must be a, a genuinely impressive sight. Yeah, and then you land up, hitch up, and then it's through to a very, very thorough and slightly insane kind of processing regime, which, now I think of it, I'm not quite looking forward to it, Johnny. I can't appreciate the views. So, but, I mean, the processing regime, I really want to, to explore that in detail, sure. But I think first we should do justice to the trip over um, and maybe even think about why these people were emigrating from their countries. Um, I've actually got some statistics uh, of where people are emigrating from. So in 1907, the countries of birth of immigrants arriving uh, in America, can you have a guess perhaps where some of these countries were. Um, wh- which ones? The European ones? Yeah, yeah, so uh, where were immigrants coming from? As uh, so I say, Russia, uh, um, Germany? Yeah, Russia is actually number one. So 19% of immigrants arriving in 1907 came from Russia. And uh, sort of Jewish uh, refugees fleeing, what, pogroms maybe, or similar... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of immigration at this time was definitely driven uh, to escape religious persecution uh, or political repression uh, or just straight up poverty. Like economic migration was a big thing. Uh, people, as I say, were hoping for this uh, this land where the streets were paved with gold, where they could uh, escape toiling in the fields and maybe make something better for themselves, escape serfdom. Little did they know they would be the ones laying the gold pavement slabs. Well, well, I expect a lot of them would. For a um, while, though, of course, there are lots of um, uh, very successful immigrants who sort of seem to hit the American dream, um, and then, uh, but a lot of uh, the sort of um, nastiness going on, especially with nativist um, people not appreciating mass immigration. Similar to this mm-hmm. day. Sure, sure. It's a little bit earlier than the time period we're thinking about, but have you seen the film Gangs in New York? Yeah. D- Daniel Day-Lewis is all right. He's good. Well, he's good. He's, uh, he's always always uh, good in the roles where he really gets into character and goes for like the uh, the method acting, and I think he does it well in this as a sort of uh, a Brit... 
British, I believe, or of British heritage. Yeah. A gang leader in New York. Um, and he's fighting against the Irish gangs who are, who are arriving more in like the 1880s. That's where the big wave of emigration from Ireland is to America. I can't remember. Is, is but, he yeah, it, it plays into this nativist sentiment British. versus... Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, he even borrowed the time machine from it to, to do method acting for that part. The time angel. That's how he does it, is he? He just hops into the time machine. The time and, angel. Uh, has a look around, a rummage around history. Exactly. So he can know what's going on. The time angel sort of um, hires it out to studios for, I, I imagine, um, highly inflated costs. Well, travelling through time is not cheap. Um, hmm. So, a lot of immigrants were arriving from Russia, 19%. A lot from Italy as well, 15% from Italy. A lot from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, 15% from Austria, 8% from Hungary. And also a lot from Germany um, in 1907. I think it's interesting that like, if you compare immigrants arriving to America now, uh, the majority are coming from countries that are not Europe. So Europe's had its way, but it had it early in the 20th century. Now immigration to America is from India, about 11%, China, around about 11% as well, Mexico. I was going to say, yeah, uh, Mexico. Uh, these are the big countries from, I've got some census data from 2017. Uh, and there aren't any European countries in the top 10. But if we look at uh, 1907, the story is completely different with uh, the top 10 dominated by these European countries. Mm. I remember look at, so, looking around me at the, at the uh, river and the ships as we get closer to the harbour. I think of that conversation we had with Dr. Kish. It was a strange one, wasn't it? Because I can't stop thinking about the pickle rolling around on the deck as I look down beneath me at the, at the deck. Do you remember him at K Dr. Kish in the pickle? Well, he, he was thinking uh, about the animated mice immigrants. Fictional, yeah. Coming over. Uh, the fictional animated mice immigrants. What was, this, what was the film called? Something Tale? American Tale. <laughs> American tail. Yeah. Yes. That's probably tail spelt like mouse tail. T A I L. Yeah. If you've got some time, check out American tail. See if you think it is an accurate experience uh, of this ship ride over. Uh, Better like, to like, What do you actually think the ship hand. ride was like? Well. So, what do you think the ship ride over was like? Do you think it was. Uh, you know, easy cruising. Where from? Luxurious, or was it going to be quite a hard voyage over? I suspect well, these are going to be obviously these. There's going to be a lot of poor people and refugees, so they're going to be packed onto these boats. So they're not going to be pleasant, I don't think. I mean, look, we're obviously on a slightly luxurious time machine converted boat right now, um, but yeah, these must have been really full, uh, packed people packed in. Lots of um, sort of shipping companies and steamship companies making maximum uh, sort of profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, jam them in, pack them high in the steerage. There were, of course, first and second class passengers on the journey over, and they, they were fine. You know, they had a, a pretty decent time of it. Of course. Uh, I forget that ships. weird. Weirdly, I forget that they were also... Um, first class people etc I mean obviously the Titanic mm -hmm. will come yeah. to yeah the, fir the first and second class passengers they could arrive in New York and they didn't even have to undergo an inspection process at uh, Ellis Island uh, they were just like given a sort of cursory inspection aboard the ship uh. with, the, with the theory being that if a person could afford to purchase a first or second class ticket they were affluent and less likely to become a Sort of public charge in yeah. America due to any medical or legal reasons. Uh, they they, they right. were the people, the desirables they wanted in, definitely, and no questions asked. But those in steerage, they had yeah, a much worse time on the journey over because, as you say, the conditions were very cramped and crowded. Uh, 
you were all, like there were bunk beds and hammocks strung up, and you were all shoved in together. Mini Titanic some, for the listener. It, it was, yeah. If you've seen the film Titanic, it would have been somewhat similar. Well, we'll to be that coming to that, uh, Johnny. <laughs> we'll to what? It's only a few years away. Enough. We might get some it's views for that one. Away, yeah. Um, Listens, views. But yeah, some some of these ship rides over, men and women were separated, so um, it, it wasn't pleasant by any stretch of the imagination. Although steamships, they're the big game changer here. They actually made the crossing from Europe pretty quickly, so you could do it in like two weeks or ten days, um, maybe even on the faster ones. Yeah. You know, in, in one week you could be across the ocean. And um, they're but like, yeah, I, I believe, pleasant. I believe at this time there's so, men, like it's the steamship boom is so great that you've just there. Apparently, it was like traffic, like going through. You were there were there were a lot of steamships going across the Atlantic, so it was quite unusual. We'll come to this later, I know, uh, for the Titanic to um, have been left sort of pretty much alone as a ship because usually they're all over the place, and it was like the M25. That's a really bad example. I'm not a driver, you can tell. Um, but a road, you know, a busy, a busy shipping lanes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it was the M25, a circular, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, a circular road, they end up exactly back where they started. In what, what would, what would but that let's be? Let's not get carried away with the Titanic. Well, um, we'll have time of course, oh, no, no, no I'm not asking about Titanic. But what, um, what would be the M25? What similar thing, which is much more relevant? No, you're right. Let's kind of forget about the M25. What, We're in 1907. What, Look at what road would connect Europe and America if it was a motor. Uh, yeah, what? I, I'm <laughs> just too confused to even think about that. Let's just gaze Let's out at it. Lady Liberty. And... Let's just ignore it. We're, we're not gonna gonna worry about what the Atlantic crossing would have been if it was a British motorway. Probably the M1, though. Like nice and direct, north to south, maybe east to west. <laughs> yes, um, but yeah, shippy. The, the journey over it wasn't pleasant at all. There were no toilet facilities, so people would be pissing and just dropping trousers and pooing off the side. <laughs> Say dropping uh, turns. No, no separate dining facilities. I doubt there was any way to wash your hands. Um, got dirt and grime, rotting food rolling around like this uh, pickle from the American Tale. I th- I thought they were sort of quite strictly. I, we, well, it, well, actually, no, I don't know. I find it weird that they wouldn't wash them given how strict they were about like their, the contagious diseases and keeping them all separated on the ship for that reason. Sure, and sure. All. I think you would have to have some inspection when you're getting on the ship. it probably depend very much on the ship, but you, you've just got poor conditions in the steerage. You've got like unwashed bodies where you certainly get lice. And if someone has a cough or a cold it's going to spread very quickly uh, i imagine they've got some like cursory checks but really the the inspection process at ellis island is where they're weeding out disease and yeah um yeah and even men- and that's, you, that's where the real checks come in you, you're, you're not even allowed to be mentally ill are you i'm just thinking i mean we're, we're heading towards the processing center and i think you're not allowed to be mentally ill and come here are oh, they going to get me, Johnny? That's, that's true. That is true. But anyway, you, you've managed to to travel across, so you've endured this less than pleasant journey over. It's no cruise. Um, you know, let's say probably on average about 10 days, a week or so, of cruising in the basement of a ship. Mm. Do ships have basements? No, they have holds in the hold of a ship. I don't think they I, were in I the hold. I imagine you could Oh, yeah, they were in the deck. hold, weren't they? They literally pat <laughs> them in the hold. <laughs> Um, yeah. Like cattle, and sometimes the same ships will be used for cattle as mm, well. Mm. Anyway, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So there are some there are some good pictures of ships just arriving in in it, New York Harbor, and everyone's sort of crowded onto the deck, and there's there's no space on deck at all. So I imagine that you could come up from the hold and have a wander around, but you wouldn't you wouldn't be doing that very often. Most of the time, you're just sitting and hoping. <laughs> that the journey ends sooner or later. You're not going to be going, I'm the king of the world! No, no you're certainly not. Um, I don't think there were too many romances 
uh, like the Titanic boat portrait. Why do oh, we keep coming back were. to the Titanic? We've well, got an we'll, episode on that. Of course. Anyway, we will do an episode on that. But, but, but you know, it's to give the it gives the listener a vague idea of what these much smaller steamships vaguely alike, and they the Titanic. It's a good reference point, but we won't talk about it proper. True, true. Everyone knows the Titanic, and yeah, reference point. Uh, so they've they've come over and they get their first glimpse of the beautiful statue, the copper statue, the green lady, Lady Liberty, <laughs> holding her torch aloft. And I've got a quote from one uh, John Alabilikinian, an Armenian chap, and he says, When the horns started to blow and we saw the Statue of Liberty, I thought I was in heaven. She's up there saying, come on in. <sighs> from now on, you're a free person. And as long as you behave yourself, you're oh. coming to a country where you can, if you want, make a success. It's up to you. Have you got what it takes? What? Exactly, this is it. You know, if you want it bad enough, you can, you can have it. That's the American dream, isn't it? And this is what these people are here for. This is why they've saved up their money, uh, why they've taken the risk of getting on this, uh, on this steamship with hundreds of other people cramped together in the bottom of it. Uh, they've probably not got much money in their pockets and they're just really on a hope and a prayer um, like but Jack that hope and, and a prayer Fabrizio. is a powerful thing <laughs> indeed um, uh, but I mean I've the statue is beautiful she, she is a nice statue and I've got another quote from a, an anonymous Polish man who says the bigness of Miss Liberty overcame us no one spoke a word for she was like a goddess and we knew she represented the big, powerful country, which was to be our future home. Amazing. And at this point, um, I suppose it's it's about um, positioning, you know, trying to attract talent and labour from across the world while trying to stay out of of wars. Is that correct? Can you say that again, sorry? No, I kind of just lost my own thread there. Let's just, just press on. Here we go. We're coming up with... Oh, hang on, my monitor started falling down. Not what monitor? There's no monitors here in 1907. Six? Seven? Um, I can, we're coming into, uh, into dock, I believe. So are you ready mm -hmm. to get processed? As ready as I'll ever be. Oh, dear. They're going to put their hands up our bums, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they, they go that far. Much that once was is lost. We are time trickling. For I can see what is to come. We are time trickling. Much that once was is lost. Go back and back. Learn the lessons. This is the only way to avoid catastrophe. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the processing centre is just really a large building full of officials. And you can imagine people are pretty nervous once they arrive here because this is what is separating them from land of the free, home of the brave. Um, they've got to get through these inspections first and the first thing that they're greeted with when they arrive at the processing center on Ellis Island once they uh, shakily step off the ship onto dry land once again they're confronted with a steep metal staircase and the idea was pretty clever that this staircase will weed out those who are physically unfit uh, because they're watched very carefully as they're climbing up the staircase and anyone who fails the stairs, they're immediately pulled aside for close inspection. Uh -oh. Possibly a finger up the bum, we don't know. And expelled a lot, weren't they, if they had particular diseases and and so on? Yeah, yeah, certainly. If you have a, uh, a chronic disease or a contagious disease, um, as you mentioned, some sort of insanity... Uh, craziness in the eye um, but yeah I think proper insanity then you were denied admission and just sent back to your country of origin uh, luckily 
for those who made the journey, only about 2% of people were actually denied admi- admission. So uh, how much? the vast majority got through. Two. Two percent. How long do you think it took uh, at Ellis Island? Do you think it was like quite a quick process or slow, drawn out hours, interminable waiting hours? Looking at the, while you're shoved around various officials. Looking at the size of those queues, I would say the latter. I would have thought so as well, just when you're thinking of the sheer numbers. But actually, it's pretty quick. Um, immigrants who were approved, they only spent between two and five hours at Ellis Island. It still sounds like quite a lot, but I suppose it's not in relative terms. It, it's, it could be long, particularly if you've not got any reading material. But when you consider that most of them are just spent you know, 10 days on a steamship on the ocean, what's another two hours? Yeah. Even five, it's fine. Um, yeah, the, so they go to this uh, registry room, also called the Great Hall. And it's here that you get your medical inspection. So doctors would very quickly scan every individual for the obvious physical ailments that they knew how to detect which were reasonably a few from our modern perch Mm -hmm. sure sure so i mean the doctors actually at ellis island were meant to be quite proficient and they did something called the six second physical i'm I'm, I'm being a time snob over um johnny i'm just looking down on them even though they know no better i'm being a time snob Oh, don't you well, have a yeah, these, these doctors, I would say, were, were pretty good at analysing people just at first glance. Really? What, were um, they were like superhuman um, doctors? Or were they just looking... What, what, what were they looking for? We should, let's get into that processing centre and find out. Mm. So, it, it would have just been obvious things. Like, I don't know, a weeping eye... A weeping oh. eye? What do you mean, a weeping eye? <laughs> a weeping eye? They might have glaucoma. Or, or, I think um, they cared about that. <laughs> I'm sure they cared. These are doctors. They're professionals. <laughs> no, but never trust doctors. That's the lesson of all time. If they see someone hunched over and coughing, or like blood coming out of their nostrils, yeah, that would be or a no. their skin covered in lesions, they're gonna yep. take a second look, you know. Yeah, but I agree with those. For most people, I think a skilled doctor who does this as his day job, he he could assess you in six seconds and go, yeah, reasonable. He can work. He's, mm. you know, a hardy stock. No problem with him. And then they see like a coffee Google it, wave you through, weepy eyed old <laughs> crone bent what? double, <laughs> and <laughs> Why <are you> so <laughs> with many lesions on her, and they say no. No, we're going to check you twice. <laughs> anyway, they could identify identify many conditions. So whether they're anemic or whether they've got some lung disease, some um, something more serious, the doctors will give you a quick once over and say yes or no. Uh, if you've got something very badly wrong with you, what they would often do is take you out of the queue and put a big chalk mark on you. Immigrants reported the Great Hall to be a vociferous place, with the sounds of many different languages echoing throughout the hall's high ceilings. The arrivals were herded through metal guardrails, lining up alphabetically and according to nationality. It was in the Great Hall where immigrants would learn if they were free to enter the US or stay for further inspection. Um, Did you mention anemia and goiter? I mentioned, yeah, anemic conditions. I didn't Mm. mention goiter. That's that. Apparently, those were some of the obvious medical problems. Goiter. Uh, goiter's like a big lump, isn't it? Yeah, lumps, nodules. Well, have yeah, you got that's, any? That's going to be pretty obvious to a doctor, like a lumpy immigrant. An overall uh, enlargement of the thyroid. So, any immigrants suspected of being in questionable health, they were chalk marked with a letter of the alphabet. Uh, on their clothing or on their little plaque that they carried around their neck. So they might have like B for back problems or H for heart or yeah, G for goiter. <laughs> and yeah, they, they're, then they're taken out of line and moved to a physical or indeed mental examination room. Mm-mm. But most most people pass this preliminary medical check. I don't like the sound of um, the mental health check. See if I can find out what you have to do for that. 
I assume like anything, it's very cursory. They're not going to pick up like subtle mental disease. Of course, and they must have, yeah, they're, I mean, as you say, only 2% were sent back, as it were. Well, there's still quite a lot, I suppose. How many in total? 2 million, 4, 50 million. Yeah, so 1.25 million and 2% were sent back. So a few tens of thousands would have been sent back in 1907. Blimey, that's, I mean, when you put it like that, it's actually quite a lot. God, I wouldn't want to be on one of those ships. Everyone being a right bum mood. Those who weren't <laughs> weren't already in a <laughs> problematic state. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be the the most relaxing trip back. You'd have a few people with yeah, well, evil looks on their faces. I bet they pack them in the holds even tighter for the journey back. Over the previous uh, uh, sort of few decades, a series of laws extended excludability to persons with epilepsy, tuberculosis, trachoma, various categories of uh, quote unquote mental retardation. And to anarchists, obs, they still do, right? You bet. You how did you get? How did they let you in? Because of course we talked with Doctor Kish about your own immigrant experience. Um, sorry, just to finish off that bit. Professional beggars, former deportees, so there's no coming back, and prostitutes. I do wonder how they could spot who was a beggar or a prostitute. Probably pretty ham-fistedly, as, as is still the case, probably, to some degree, but it took quite a while, all that, to get better. Perhaps still if got they the were actively begging or prostituting in the immigration hall, the Great Hall, or on the trip over, they got a tip-off. But I, I find it hard to believe that they would just say, you, man, prostitute, or you, sir, beggar. I don't think that that would be possible. Well, clearly, they, they had their reasons. Maybe it's convicted... Um, Convicted prostitutes, maybe? Not sure. Hmm. But would they have had the records? There's only one way to find out. The answer is no, they would not have had the records. There wasn't record sharing back then. Oh, there yeah. wasn't a big database, an electronic database of who's been begging on the streets of Vienna and who's been prostituting on the streets of St. Petersburg. No, they would have had no idea. I would have imagined it was some sort of profiling, though. If you looked beggary or... Yeah. Duty, well, I mean, the, I mean, in 1900, they still use the word, just about use the word prostitute to describe all manner of things, from just uh, women with uh, children out of uh, wedlock, etc. So they probably wield, probably probably depended on how nice the immigration guy you got in the Great Hall was, or how border force. I assume that they figured out who was a beggar or a prostitute or whatever at a slightly later stage when they were asking uh, a series of questions to the newly arrived. So they'd ask things like your name, your occupation, the amount of money you carried. So obviously if you said my name is Jan Johannes, I'm a beggar, I've got three dollars in my pocket, you've immediately slipped up. But if you said my name is Jan Johannes, I'm a carpenter, and I've got four dollars in my pocket. Probably you're going to be waved through. Come this way, sir, through the great hall. So just don't don't self-incriminate, really, at the twenty-nine question I'm, stage. I'm sure they didn't. Um, well, it was just really some. important. It was just really important to the American government that these new arrivals could support themselves, that they had a little bit of money to get started. And actually, I think the the average that the government wanted it was a little bit higher than three or four dollars. That might have been a red flag. But they wanted immigrants to have somewhere between like 18 and $25 if they had that or a little bit more. No problem. Uh, then you get onto something that I would find a little bit tricky, the maths questions. Oh, God. And the logic questions. Oh. So you have to do a few, you know, basic bits of mental arithmetic. Um, yeah, some logic questions. Like there was one example when a lady or like not just a lady, there was one example when 
or one of the examples of the logic questions was how do you clean the stairs from the top or the bottom? What do you think, Phil? Top or bottom? Um, to clean stairs. I would start... Where would you start? From the top? I would have said that as well, but one well, very... Well, it depends where you are point. to start with, or where the mop is kept, or where the water source is, really. Probably would dictate it. But sorry, yes, what's the truth? True, I, I would say from the top as well, just simply because if you're going from the top, then you're not going to be like walking over what you've cleaned. You're always going down. So you clean a bit, step down, clean a bit, step down. But one very switched on Polish immigrant, a uh, certain Paulina Notkoff said, I did not come to America to wash stairs. And I think that's a pretty good response. I'm sure she got uh, waved through very quickly. So you've had these questions, you've passed them, you've demonstrated through your six second physical that you're not in any bad condition. After that, I believe that you're pretty much waved through. Um, oh, no, no, sorry. We forgot the literacy test. <laughs> oh. Whoops. Uh, you've got to be literate. Oh, fine. So We can do this. So, yeah, you, you were required to read a 40-word text in your native language. And in most tests, uh, in, in most cases, the test consisted of reading several passages from the Bible. And, yeah, quite a few people sort of knew these anyway. Um, so if you had an accommodating immigration official, they might say, you know, just, just say anything doesn't matter any any quote you know from the bible is fine and they let them through even if they couldn't read uh there were a few of course who chose verses from the bible that were designed to like purposely humiliate or frighten the immigrants which is a little bit a little bit twisted for example there was one uh immigration official who didn't like serbians very much and he always required them to read this passage from the book of james your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and you shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ooh, don't like the sound bit, of that. It's a bit over-egging that, I think, a bit intimidating. Uh, no need for that. Just, just give them a nice passage, nice Bible passage about, I don't know, land, milk and honey or something. Mm-hmm. I'm just here. I've, I've just got some shot, some uh, interesting uh, info here. Um, did you know that prostitution is still a grounds for being denied entry into the US? Although you can get a waiver somehow, not sure how. Um, conviction of crime involving moral turpitude. <laughs> there are waivers available. Okay. Uh, drug trafficking, no way, no waiver. Drug abuse or addiction, no way, no waiver available. A physical or mental disorder of public health significance, waiver available. Uh, still tuberculosis or pandemic flu or other diseases, including COVID. Note, HIV was once on this list, but no longer. So it's still like um, easy to forget how tough it is to, still. Well, it, not for you, probably, because you've actually emigrated there, as we discussed with Dr. Kish. Not I did spend some time in America. Yes, luckily, I didn't have to go over uh, on the bottom of a boat. And luckily, I didn't have to go through Ellis Island, it having been closed down, I think, sometime in 1930s. Um, it was all pretty much online <laughs> form and uh, doing some stuff at the embassy for a while. Still spent quite a bit of time in the embassy, like a good two hours, I would say. So similar processing times. Um, maybe even longer once you have to stand in, in queues at the airport and so on and process all of that. So, but they let you in. I, I'm very impressed with the way that Ellis Island was organised. It seemed, uh, yeah, pretty well run place, pretty efficient the way it could process people. In fact, uh, on April 17th in 1907, they processed an all time daily high of immigrants where 11,000. 
747 immigrants arrived. Those are big numbers. I'm not sure if it's sufficient, though, to ask people to start f- reciting Bible quotes. It just seems to me like too much, that. Um, but I know what you mean. It's an impressive... Um, you know, it would have been an astonishing sight, and it is. That's good. We can see it. We're t- travelling back in time. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the image of this great hall where you've just got people from all over uh, Europe and indeed all over the world gathered together and you've got the immigration officials who often spoke a few languages trying to organise this and bring some order to the chaos and sort of filter people in Mm. some sort of coherent manner. And, yeah, give them their little rubber stamp and then pass them on onto a new life. And I assume, like, most of them were trying to uh, trying to be as efficient as possible. They weren't trying to be nasty. They weren't trying to weed people out without any good reason. No. Uh, it was very much part of the American, uh, the American way of life to adopt immigrants at this time and to bring them in to the fold. Even today, government policy on it, it's so unpredictable and gets buffed. If, if a lot of if there's a big wave of immigration, usually you get some discontent and that it all sort of, the policy sort of zigzags or tries to maintain something there to keep the nativists on side. Would it be fair to say? There was sort of this relentless group of politicians and nativist activists who were, were always demanding increased restrictions on immigration and this is where things like the literary press got brought in the acts restricting and the chinese and stuff yeah, uh, a few yeah, decades the chinese earlier. exclusion act that's the one um the alien contract labor law various quotas were put in place uh, national origins act laws came in a little bit later as well with restrictions based upon uh, the number of ethnic groups who were already living in the country so there were there were some restrictions although even at this point they were still a very welcoming nation to immigrants because america realized that to become uh the country that it wanted to be it still needed all this immigrant labor force to come in and help build the nation indeed um i i would say this is um efficient as a sort of practical um, execution of an overall project but I would doubt the efficiency of some of the projects ideas and philosophies like um, and you know bureaucracies that divide people up into categories uh, you know they're pretty ruthless um, not, mm. but, I, but I agree with your points that these you know the people weren't ruthless I mean to be honest you do get the odd I mean border force always attracts a certain type of person let's be honest but um, there would have been nice ones as well. Not always attracts. Let me say that again. Border force can attract a certain kind of person. Um, yeah. Have you ever been frisked? Have I ever been frisked? That's a very personal question. Um, yes, I've been frisked a few times, given the old tap down at the airports and so on. How did you... Uh, f- how going did- into concert a few times or football stadiums you get an odd frisking yeah hurry time trippers time waits for no man coming back to uh to the few that were sent sent away um there was uh the losers boat yeah the losers boat i feel (laughs) particularly sorry for any children who were singled out because uh, sick children who were aged 12 or older they were sent back to Europe alone which if you're on the loser's boat you know it's a pretty bad boat to be in but if you're just I don't know 13 and like oh bummer this really sucks you know all my family have abandoned me basically and I'm sent back to live with great aunt in Bulgaria or wherever they might be from um, whereas children younger than 12, they actually had to be accompanied by a parent. So this was even worse. You know, there were tearful scenes with mm. families uh, with a sick young child. God. And they'd have to decide who would go and who would stay. So that would be really, uh, re- really gut-wrenching, really heartbreaking scenes. 
But as I said, few and far between. Only two percent were denied a mission. So let's not get too carried away with this uh, visage of Ellis Island as being like a uh, no, 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 no. of tears. I think not at all. Not called. at all. Just just two. It per- wasn't really that bad. Just two percent tears. The um two percent tears. I've got I've got a good little uh, joy and dream. <laughs> I've got a good little passage here from Medical Inspection of Immigrants at Ellis Island. It's called Supporters <laughs> Supporters of Unrestricted Immigration failed to organise effectively against medical regulation because it was difficult to challenge the exclusion of disease carriers and public charges. Uh, The medical inspection apparently was billed as a rational and incremental measure that could satisfy, at least temporarily, both extremist nativist and moderate forces. Contested only by the fractionalised semi-organised foreign vote, medical restriction of immigrants was an effective political ploy. Government authorities owed neither rights nor favours to these pre-citizens. I think that's quite interesting in view of... Well, there you go. No rights, no favours. And a nice political fudge, does, as, you know, as usual today, except in extreme circumstances, even when the debate gets pretty hot on immigration, you know, all countries need it, effectively. So it's like, it's interesting to see how those politics shift and that nice compromise fudge. Really relevant, I don't think. Well, we've been being processed for a long time. When are we going back? to the garage we're going back to the garage soon phil but uh, i i was speaking to one immigrant a certain sadie frown from poland oh, you yeah. want to hear what she had like to say name. yes please she she sums it up all quite nicely i had a really really good chat with her we came by steerage on a steamship in a very dark place that smelt dreadfully there were hundreds of other people packed in with us men women and children and almost all of them were sick It took us 12 days to cross the sea, and we thought we should die. But at last the voyage was over, and we came up and saw the beautiful bay, and the big woman with the spikes on her head, and the lamp that is lighted at night in her hand. So again, Statue of Liberty is such a big thing for people once they arrive. And she's not the only person to call her the big woman. Like the, the, The size of her is really quite imposing. Do you, shall, shall we get back in the time though and and finish up i think we've, we've been better, doing an we better hour go home soon we don't want to stay here forever on ellis island it, it's fun no and interesting while it lasts but you know everyone i've met they don't want to hang around here they just want to get off to the to the mainland to start their new life start their adventure uh get back to the garage Yep, yep. Well, well, grab it and let's go. Let's let's blast right. back to present. Have time. you have you got your item? I've got mine. Yeah, I, I'm good to go. Ooh. It's in my pocket this time. Time change. Oh god, I can't wait to find out what item you brought back, uh, Johnny from from 1907. So I've brought back an item that I think will actually be quite useful in the current day, and. I've mm-hmm. got a card that uh, that says vaccinated and disinfected, and it's got a stamp on it, an official stamp. Ooh. So I'm thinking that, that if, a green card. if anyone stops me now and asks me for my vaccine passport, I'm just going to wave this at them and hope that they don't see the stamp from 1907. It's in, it's in like a... Oh, let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight languages. It's got um, keep this card to avoid detention at quarantine and on railroads <laughs> in the United States. Is it like a green card then? Oh, that's good. I'm jealous. It, it was just a card that they gave. Uh, they gave people. You can make that as a green card. They'll let you who, in. Yeah, who'd had their who'd had their vaccinations and their um, and their disinfection been through that in fact it was the, the only real uh documents that it, that uh the immigrants uh were required to keep well there you go i'm feel a bit jealous of that it's quite a practical item and the mine is not at all practical what's your item phil um i brought back a goiter in a jar <laughs> That's horrible. Why did you bring that? 
<laughs> I couldn't think of anything else, and I saw it when we were in the detention centre. Not detention centre, sorry, you know, the Great Hall. And um, snatched it. I just thought it would be funny at the time, and then you brought back a sports almanac type thing. Oh, well. Um, we best try... Best, uh, you best go back upstairs to your family... Um, and I'm going to... The goiter can keep me company while I look at these uh, YouTube numbers. Oosh. Please do like and subscribe. YouTube, go to YouTube, subscribe, like. Should have put this at the beginning. That's something on my list. Yeah, I'll leave you to stare at the goiter. Every Mexico, there's a bunch of running low, a lot of kids are watching low, goodbye San Francisco!